Hello, friends. I took a little bit of vacation time, so I didn't do recording last week since I did not preach last Sunday. But I thought uh, this lesson here is based on the idea of a, I came up with when I was thinking about what we've gone through this last year. As last year, about a year ago, and people probably say everything changed last year at a particular time as it relates to their life. It may have been whenever the NCAA tournament canceled all their games. And if you're a big March Madness person, that, that's kind of like, okay, that changed everything. It may have been from the point of view of uh, the toilet paper shortage. And you go to uh, stores and all of a sudden there were things that were no longer there. And so you may remember the great toilet paper shortage of 2020. Or it may have been other things, the fact that you could not go into Walmart with that mask and other things, uh, essential and non-essential workers that became a term that got to be used then. And as I, I thought about that, I just thought about how drastically things have changed in our country in the last year and how when we look back at it now, we probably have a different perspective than we did a year ago. And one word that kept on coming to my mind is the word knowledge. And in a sense that people now in medicine uh, have better knowledge of the virus, about how to control it, how to treat it. New drugs have been created. Uh, so as it goes the vaccine, the immunization seem to be paying off. And eventually when, who knows how long it'll be, but eventually in the future, they're going to talk about, you remember when people used to die of COVID-19? You remember that you used to, that whole nation shut down because that, and people will maybe even scoff at that thing, and that, that's, that's nothing now. That's a, that's a disease, that's a problem we have to eradicate or take care of, and there's no more danger for that anymore. Much like we do other diseases that may have been 100 years ago could have been life-threatening. But yet, we realize that because we did not have that knowledge that over half a million people died in our country, and well over a million people in the world around us have, have died, and that's because our knowledge was incomplete about how to treat COVID-19. And I want to make a comparison of that with a spiritual idea here. And first of all, the word knowledge. Let me just give you a definition of it. This comes from one of my favorite websites, dictionary.com. And so it says, an acquaintance with facts, truths, or principles as from a study or investigation. And it goes on, it says familiarity or conversance uh, as with a particular subject or branch of learning. So it may be in a particular area you have this knowledge. Acquaintance or familiarity gained by sight, experience, or report. Something you may have personally experienced and can talk about on that level. The fact or state of knowing. The perception of truth or fact. The perception. Not necessarily what is, but your perception of that. Clear and uncertain mental apprehension. Awareness as of fact or circumstances. And the second definition, all that kind of goes in that first definition. Second definition is saying to know by studying a subject, to know by personal experience. The word science that we use uh, originally comes from the Greek word, Greek, uh, excuse me, Latin word, santia, which means knowledge. And the whole, the word idea of science is the acquiring of knowledge, but knowing, uh, gaining expertise, uh, experience is all part of the idea of science. And as I read that definition, I realized we make our decisions based on two things. Uh, one is that what we know or what we think we know. And, and I'll get into a little bit more about what we think we know a little bit later on in this lesson. But because if our, if our knowledge is erroneous, if we think we know something and we accept something as truth as not, then most likely we're going to make bad decisions. If, if I think that this medicine is going to cure me when actually it could kill me and I take it because my knowledge is wrong, then bad things still happen. And so it's important for me to ha understand that my knowledge needs to be actually truthful. And I find in the Bible we find, and for instance, in Acts 17, chapter 22, Paul's at Mars Hills, Mars Hill, and it starts saying, then Paul stood in, in the midst of the Aerobicus, and I said, men of Athens, I perceive that all things are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. 
And so they were worshiping God that they acknowledged. They really did not have any knowledge of. They really did not know anything about. And there's a case that they were making bad decisions because they acknowledged the fact that they were worshiping something they didn't know. And Paul perceived then the teach them about the true God. Now, if you go on down to verse 24, it says, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Nor is he worshiped in man's hands, those who need anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And it's made from one blood of every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined there are the pre appointed times and boundaries of their dwellings. So they should seek the Lord in the hope they might grow for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. So he proceeds to tell them, here are some of the attributes, here are some of the things about the true God that you need to understand. And what he's doing is he's perfecting their knowledge. He's giving them knowledge because without knowledge, we make, you know, without knowledge, we cannot make proper decisions. And the second basis by which we make decisions, first of knowledge, the second one is emotion. How I feel about something, my hunch about something, you know, those kind of things. And we see that people ought to make decisions based on that. And I can read in the Bible about one situation where that person reacted emotionally because their knowledge was wrong. In that case with Jacob, when the brothers came back and told him that Joseph, his son, had been killed. Or actually, they kind of implied that. They inferred that. They didn't tell, go, come right out and say that. But you read Genesis 37, verse 31. So they took a tunic, uh, Joseph's tunic, killed a kid of the goats, and dipped the tunic in the blood... Then they set the tunic of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, We have found this. Do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? And he recognized this, that it is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him, and without doubt, Joseph torn him to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes with sackcloth on his waist and mourned for his son many days. Now, you see, the emotion was there, but because it, had, it was based on false knowledge, based on something that was a lie. As far as the implication is, what they had done was give him every reason to believe that Joseph had been killed, but really he hadn't. And so emotions can uh, often based on what we know, but also they can be very wrong. Now, how many times they have people say, well, how do you feel about something? And then again, I have all kinds of things. How do you feel about the vaccine? How do you feel about that? How do you feel about homosexuality? How do you feel about abortion? And about how, many, how do you feel about any other subject? You know, we could just throw in a bunch of other subjects also. And we have to realize that feelings are a very powerful tool because they are our feelings. And, and they can be the hindrance or they can even aid us at times if based on proper emotion. And then also, you have to realize feelings are based largely upon human traditions. What we have grown up learning and have accepted, and we are bound to it emotionally. Over in Galatians 1, verse 14, the Apostle Paul writes, And I advance you of Judaism beyond me and my contemporaries, my own nation, being more exceedingly exalted for the traditions of my fathers. Now, he at first rejected Christianity, Christ being Son of God, and based on the fact of partly because of the human tradition while he had been taught from his youth up. And uh, again, many of us can relate to that. And so we have to realize that now not all traditions can be bad. And Second Thessalonians 2 verse 15, Paul there writes, Therefore, brethren, stand fast, hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now in that case, the word tradition is applied to the word of God, that which has been handed down to you by the word of God. The human traditions, which is talked about in Galatians 1, verse 14, really, human traditions can sometimes be masquerading as knowledge. You know, it's kind of like, well, everybody knows that. Everybody knows that, that you can't do that or that this is the only way that can be done or, or this is the way it's always been done. And again, I noticed in the Bible that there are times where uh, people did things because of their traditions. Over Mark 7, verse 7. And in vain they worship me, teaching us doctrines that are the commandments of men. For while inside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of waters and cups, or pitchers and cups, so many other such things you do. And he said to them, All too well, you reject the commandment of God, 
they may keep your tradition. You see, there's a conflict there between what they had learned, what they had grown up doing, versus what actually God wanted them to do. And then Galatians, excuse me, Colossians 2, verse 8. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and anti deceit according to the tradition of men, according to base principles of the world, not according to Christ. And so there could be traditions we develop that are in direct conflict with the Bible. And again, you know, it's a case where, you know, well, grandma and grandpa always did this, or this is the way it's always been. I, I grew up doing this, and I can't change. And traditions can be hard to give up. Uh, again, because, because this is what our loved ones have done. This is what grandpa used to do. This is what grandma used to do. Or this is what my family family's always done. We've always done this. And so the challenge is when we learn something that contradicts our idea of knowledge, that contradicts our emotions, what do we do? Do we get angry? Some people do. Get mad? Storm off someplace? Do we ignore it? Pretend like it's not there. I didn't hear that. No, I'm just going to keep on doing the same thing. I'm just going to, I didn't hear that. Try to refute it. I don't believe that's right. And, And try to argue with it. Or examine it and see, okay, maybe my tradition is wrong. Well, how are we going to react to that? And we can react purely emotionally to so something. I find the Acts 19 chapter at Essus. At Essus, if you look in Acts 19, read with me, start verse 23. It says, About that time there arose a great commotion about the way. Now that's talking about Christianity, that's talking about the disciples of Christ, about the teaching of the gospel. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Diana, uh, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of Simarach Pace and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Now we see in here, not only in Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this pause persuaded and turned many away many uh, people saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. Not only is this trade of ours in danger falling to disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Dinah and may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. And then when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Dinah of the Ephesians. You notice here, and there wasn't an argument about refute to what Paul had said, but his argument was really one of economics and emotion. We make money from this. We, we make our livelihood from this, and therefore we cannot have this going on. We can't allow this to continue going on. And so they reacted very emotionally. They, they got angry and created a riot in essence. We can react with ungodly zeal. Over in Romans 10, verse 1. Bread my heart's desire, prayer to God for Israel, they may be saved. For I bear them with us, they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And so we may be zealous, we may, again, a lot of this is emotionally driven, and we just keep on being zealous in our false religion. And so we have to be aware of false knowledge, because false knowledge often makes me feel good. I heard something many years ago always stuck in my mind, and that is, it doesn't take a very compelling argument to convince me of something I already believe, or that I want to believe. And so... It, I may feel safe. I may feel good about this so-called knowledge, but false knowledge will eventually even end in destruction. In fact, in Romans first chapter, Paul talks about the Gentiles and some things they had done. I want you to notice in Romans 1 verse 22, it said, profess and be wise what they became fools. They thought they had their own set of knowledge. They thought they had more knowledge than God, basically here. And then you go down verse 28, it says, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to the base mind to do those things which are not fitting. And so God allowed them to go ahead. They, just didn't, they rejected God's word, and therefore God said, go ahead. They didn't change his word, but said, go ahead. And they, they went ahead. And so sometimes people do the same thing. But how we don't react when our, our traditions are Knowledge contradicts what the Bible says. Do we misuse scriptures to justify ourselves? Over in Second Peter 3, verse 16. As also in all his epistles, speaking of them these things which 
are some things hard to understand, which untaught, unstable men twist their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. Now, this Peter writing about Paul's writings and saying some of the things Paul has written is kind of deep, it's kind of hard, and, and, and it's kind of complex sometimes. But he said, you know what? Do we have people here that take those scriptures and they twist them and make them say what they want? And we know people like that. People that can take a Bible passage and stand it on its head, make it contradict itself before, by the time they're old with, and say, well, that may be what the Bible said, but that's not what it means. And he said, what they've done is that it's to their own destruction. And so we have to be careful doing that. So unless they said these other things about spiritual knowledge. One is, knowledge is based on truth. Man discovers things, but he does not discover truth. Those things already exist. The law of gravity existed a long time before Sir Isaac Newton talked about the law of gravity. Okay? We understood it better, but that truth is already there. Knowledge is based on truth. Man does not discover or invent something that already exists. When Jesus and his prayer in John 17, verse 17 says, Sanctify them by your truth, your word is truth. Truth is defined by the word of God. Okay, that is what truth is. That's not up for debate. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. It doesn't matter what other people say about it. It doesn't matter what the traditions have been. Truth is just that. It's settled by the word of God. Over in Psalms 119, verse 142, your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and your law is truth. There's not a thing about God's word that God has told men to do that's wrong. And truth exists whether we like it or not. The thing about truth is, you may try to argue with it. I try, I've tried to get in to escape two things in arguments. One is, I try not to argue with something that's plenty of the truth. And the second is, I try not to argue about something I don't know about. Okay, I try to stay out of those arguments. I don't know anything about it. I, don't, I can't argue about it. And so that's one thing here. You can't argue with truth. And it's not based on how you feel. Okay, so when we look at the Bible and we read a passage, I do not ask people, how do you feel about that? It's not a debate. It's in what God says. The second thing is, truth is revealed from God. God shows what truth is. Over in Luke 1, verse 76, it says, You, child, be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord and prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins. John the Baptist's very purpose was to go before Jesus and prepare people for the coming of Christ but they give knowledge of salvation to his people for the remission of their sins. See, it's something that is revealed for God. Jesus' very mission, when he came down here, to reveal the very will of God, to reveal truth to mankind. Jesus spoke about being truth himself. In John 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is the truth. We can't argue with him. What he says is true, whether we like it or not. The third thing is, truth, though, must be sought. And what I mean by that is that it's not something simply inborn with us. You don't know the Bible just because you're born. You don't know what the will of God just because you are a person. That there has to be something done. You have to learn what the truth is. You have to spend time reading the Word of God and and studying and doing what God's Word says. Those are things how we learn. Remember the very basic definition of truth earlier, or give me a knowledge earlier, and it was involved not just the study, but the doing of it. And so if we want to know God's Word, we have to study it. And then, you know, that, so that gets to the point of how to attain what well, that is by reading it. Ephesians 3, verse 3 says, How that by revelation, that is by inspiration, he made known to me the mystery, as I have re briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. You see, inspiration is to reveal something. And reveal, what something revealed to us is in order to give us knowledge, to give us better understanding of what God says to do. So he said, when you read it, you may understand better. You may have more under knowledge of what God said to do. 
And so we have to read it. That's how we're going to attain knowledge. And fourth thing is, knowledge is, consp- is connected with spiritual growth. If you want to grow spiritually, first of all, you have to have knowledge. And Colossians 1 verse 9 and verse 10. Say, so for this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. They may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in knowledge of God. Notice that word knowledge is used twice here in this passage. One is that you may be filled with it, and then the second is that you may be increasing in knowledge of God. But in between is the idea of bearing fruit, of being fruitful in every good work. So if you want to increase spiritually, you have to study the Bible. So Tyler people said, I don't know why I'm so weak spiritually. I don't know why this person is weak spiritually. It goes back to, do they know the Word of God? That's usually the first thing. And then to learn more about God so you can do more. And do you do more so you can learn more about Him and His righteousness. So it becomes a cycle. The more you know, the more you do. The more you do, the more you know. And so study it so it's apply the Word of God. Don't just be a scholar, but be a living disciple. Be a living scholar of the Word of God while applying it to your life. And then you will increase spiritually. And the fifth thing, though, is also knowledge. It's a knowledge we learn about love, which we often think of being simply emotion. But love is not simply emotion. Love is based on not how we feel, but what we know. Knowledge and love go together. They have to be mixed together. And I think I say that because the church of Corinth had an issue going on, one of the big issues. They had many of them, but one of the big issues was the idea of eating meat sacrificed to idols. And so in writing about that, and Paul writes quite a bit about that, chapters 8 and 9 and goes on. And, but as he writes about it, he says in chapter 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge, knowledge both of the love and of us. And so he makes a connection there of knowledge and love goes together. But knowledge by itself can be a bad thing. It has to be mixed with love. And so as he goes on down in that chapter, he points out, we know there's no such thing as idols. So he doesn't say, this is not a subject matter. I mean, let's just forget about talking about this. No, he's talking about we have to have love as we deal with this. And then going down to the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, verse 2, he says, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains but have not love, I have nothing. And so, and so there he said, you know what? You have to have knowledge mixed with love. Okay, my point is this. Don't use the word of God as a club. Sometimes people could do that. But also don't use love as an excuse to bypass the word of God. They go together. Love is contained in the Word of God. The Word of God is to be spoken out of love for the souls of people. And the only way we really know what proper love is is really by the Bible. It defines for us what love is. It tells us what love is. It tells us how to act in love. And so knowledge and love must be mixed in together. As look, as the thing about this subject, our knowledge may change, but truth does not. I think I said that earlier. Truth does not change. When Jesus says, sanctify them by your word, your word is truth. That word giving, given to us in the gospel, that word start that was preached on the day of Pentecost and onward that I read about in the Bible, that word does not change. My understanding of it does. My knowledge of it does. I learn more about it every day. But the Bible still says the same thing said before I was born. And I'll say the same thing as it says now after I die. And so for us to make good decisions, we have to be informed about the Word of God. We must know God's Word. But then also we must respect God's Word. We must accept His Word. And we must live by His Word. That's when knowledge does us good. So hopefully, as you sit down with your Bible... As you start reading things and you come across something you think, well, I don't understand that or I don't like that or I disagree with that, go back and study some more. Maybe you're 
you got the wrong idea. Maybe it's that you're wrong and you need to change what you're saying, what you're doing. But what are we going to do when we have knowledge? We must conform to it. We must use it to make better decisions, to live better lives, serve to God. If I can help aid you and understand more about God's will, then let me know. I'd be glad to sit down with you and study with you for the Word of God, answer any questions you have. If you can, come be with us at Lyak Road. I built a building located at 1687, Lyak Road, Winchville, Kentucky. Sunday morning, we have Bible class at 9.30, worship at 10.25. Sunday evening at 5 p.m., we have worship. And Wednesday nights, we have a Bible class at 7 p.m. I hope everybody is doing well. If I can aid you in any way, why don't you let me know. Thanks for listening. And feel free to share this and also hit the like button.